Wexler. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. So welcome back to episode 157 of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook and myself, Jackie Jones. And what we're going to be looking at this week is how to deal with self-criticism in the therapy process. Yes, self uh, negative talk. I was just thinking, as you said, a hundred and did you say hundred and fifty seven? Yeah, I can't believe we've climbed up as far as this. I know. Um, but anyway, people who are on YouTube uh, on my channel, you'll probably see that I'm much browner because I've been on holiday, um, and uh, I I hope I'm more tanned. I was thinking. Um, I should be after having some sun for the for the last week. So, um, but you said I look more. You said I. You you simply said I look healthier. So you look, uh, you look way, healthier. Yeah, we're all a bit wishy washy in going through the winter, <laughs> but you look healthier. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, it's a long way, a long way. Anyway, that's my pastiming. You know, it's an interesting one, isn't this? Because I think most people who start their professional life as psychotherapists, whether it's in placements, which is where most people start their professional life as a psychotherapist and counsellor, they yeah. usually start it on a placement within their training programme. So um, whether you started off there uh, or not, wherever you started, and the seasons therapist and counsellor, which has been around for a very long time, They'll all be dealing with variations and intensity of um, intrusive thoughts and negative self-criticism. Yeah. Because most clients people see are, are, are hard on themselves. And that's really what causes most of the problems. And I, I, in fact, I saw somebody today and uh, for an assessment. And this person was, I don't know, in their 60s, 70s. Um, and they, you know, they talked about their anxiety, depression, and incapacitation. And I, I asked her, are, are you quite hard on yourself? And I knew the answer would be yes. Yeah. The answer was yes. So I said, well, just to let you know, 80% of the work we're going to be doing is about finding a friend in yourself and compassion yeah compassion is the antidote to negative self-criticism but it's easier said than done in it bob it's easy for us to go into that negative place of self-criticism it's it's a lot easier than what it is to be compassionate with ourselves um well i i think what happens is you know uh, you know you know we well, the answer to you, of course, is yes, uh, because we're often telling ourselves off. But actually, where that process comes from uh, is is often not our own voice. Yeah. It's the interject, what we've taken from our significant others that are, are continually defining us and telling us off. Yeah. And the you becomes an I. So you are worthless. You are selfish. You are hopeless. Whatever we could, I could go on. on. Yeah. And eventually, after hearing that so many times in many different ways, whether it's verbal or non-verbal, that the infant or child or turns the you to an I. And then what happens is they start believing it's their own voice. Yeah. I think I hear a lot from clients that it's not a conscious thought. It just happens. So it kind of slips in under the radar. We don't even realize that we're doing it a lot of the time. We we notice the, the feelings that come along with it, but we don't really catch the thinking part. No, they don't. You, you mean you don't catch the narrative? Yes. Yeah. With it. Um, yes, I think that's true. And 
I think all therapists job in a way is to, to help clients put two and two together. Yeah. And well, if you did or even guessed what those sort of words would, would be with those feelings that have crept up on you, what would the words be? Yeah. And they'll soon tell you. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Because we do, we all have that narrative running in the background pretty much all the time. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's it's, it's a major major work that most therapists, stroke counsellors will be working with. Yeah. I really believe that. Yes, yeah. It's easier said than done, of course. But I think the first step, and it may take a while, Jackie, I'm not saying this is overnight, but the first step for all people listening to this or watching this, or whether they only just started out on counsellors or they're experienced therapists, the first step really is to help people be aware of the narrative or the negativity that goes with their feeling of badness or depression or anxiety or whatever they've come with. Yeah. And help them be aware of, of what they might actually be saying to themselves to, to slow down their thinking and just reflect on when you do uh, feel bad or you feel you can't get out of bed in the morning or you've got no motivation. What do you actually say to yourself? Yeah. What's going through your head? Yes, yeah. And there'll be something like, oh, well, I should be able to get out of bed. I'm so stupid. I'm so hopeless. I can never get it right. And you'll hear that whole negative spiralling. Yeah. Even if you just said, well, I'd like you to guess. Yeah, and I think what you said then is really valid. It's that slowing, slowing the process down, slowing the thoughts down, so that you can actually, you know, tune in and hear what they're saying. Oh, and they need to tune in, and yeah. they need to hear what they're saying as well. Yeah, and have it fed back to them. Yes, yes, yeah. Because often it it's you know we trying to predict the future or we're in the past or whatever and it's very difficult for us to be in the present a lot of the time particularly when we're overwhelmed or we're tired or we're not feeling well that to me is where my internal dialogue kind of goes into overdrive i mean you're right in what you're saying about it creeps up on you um a friend of mine uh, i'm not talking about a therapy session here um and she was talking about how she often gives herself a hard time. Now, if I'd been a therapist, I mean, being paid and yeah, the, yeah, I might have gone down the road of slowing this down. What's the thought process that comes with it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, bit. But I, as I'm not in that, as I wasn't in that sort of contractual position, I simply said, "Oh, where does that come from?" And she insist, insisted that it that it, that it was her voice. But it came from her. So, yeah. so I certainly was not in the position of being a therapist. We're having a cup of tea in Costas. I wasn't going to go down the road of what well, I think therapists need to go down, yeah. which is helping me understanding that often the negative decisions they make about themselves, or certainly a negative um, narrative, actually isn't theirs. Yeah. And that that's the interesting thing is because, you know, it, sometimes it's maybe questioning whether what that internal voice is saying is actually our true belief, and it's not. No, it, it's not our stuff that we're you know that we're replaying. <clears throat> Absolutely. So first step is to help them being aware. Yeah. The narrative that goes with the feelings. Yeah. That may take some time, but that's the first step, I believe. Second step, which usually takes a lot longer and inquires a lot more uh, inquiry is to help them make the realisation that it's not their voice, it's not actually their voice, or it's not their belief systems. It actually comes from somewhere else. And that piece of therapy takes quite a long time before they really, really take that on board. Yeah. That is quite a pivotal moment in therapy when they get to that place. 
Is it always a person or can it be an event that causes it? If it that really, makes sense. It, no, it doesn't. So, well, it, I'm sure it will work. <laughs> I'm sure it will be when you explain. Well, say, for example, somebody is involved in, I don't know, a, a road traffic accident or, okay. or an event of some description. Trauma. And they, yeah, there's some trauma that's happened. Can that create negative feelings or doubt or anxious thoughts or whatever, rather than it being an interject from a person? I believe it always comes from somewhere else. Now, you may make a decision as you go around life about the fact that I'm really hopeless and I can never get things right. Um, I'm really stupid. There it goes again. So you might make decisions, but it will be in response to the consistent narrative. Okay. So when you have the trauma or the life event or whatever we're talking about, then you will say those things. Well, here I go again. If I hadn't done this, if I'd done this, it would slow down. If I thought before I spoke, I wouldn't have done this. I wouldn't have had this crash. X X X. Yeah. That comes from an earlier, earlier process. Yeah. Okay. We repeat it, in other words. Yes. Yeah. Repetitive process. We, in TA, is called script. Yes. So we keep repeating to confirm our life decisions about ourselves and other people. Yeah. And it's very familiar. The, you know, the, the narrative, the stories that we tell ourselves are, are very familiar to us. Yeah, it's like dominoes, you know. Yeah. Make a decision in response to X, X and X. It becomes our life decision, which we call script and TA. And then another domino falls down. Then that confirms that. And another domino falls down. And then we are on that repetitive process which confirms our life script and identity about ourselves and other people yeah what we need to do as therapists is get back to when or help the third client get back to when we made those first decisions about ourselves which are quite often at a non-verbal level yeah however we need to help them put rudimentary sentence constructions to that non-verbal feeling. Yeah, so when you're saying non-verbal, that usually means that we made the decision at a really young age I mean, <laughs> before we had the ability to string sentences together and make that, yeah, yeah. We often make it from a non-verbal intuitive position. Yeah. And then it quite often gets held in the body, actually. Yeah. And I think that's why sometimes it's difficult to kind of pin it down or to work out what it is and where it's coming from, because it does feel like part of us. Because, that's fine. Yeah. Well, you're right. So someone comes into the therapy group or comes in to see you individually and you say, how are, how, how are you? What do you want to work on today? Oh, I've got such a headache. I've got such a headache. I've had this headache ever since I woke up. I knew I was coming to see you at nine o'clock in the morning. But I woke up with this headache and I nearly didn't make it to therapy and I feel really bad. Yeah. Then I say back, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. What about if we put that headache onto a cushion or onto our chair and talk to this headache and find out what it's all about? So a person puts the headache onto the chair and you say to the client, okay, let's talk to the headache. I can talk to the headache, but what do you want to say to the headache? Oh, what I want to say is, how come you're hurting me so much? And how come you're attempting to stop me coming to my therapist? Well, okay, say the headache and repeat back, respond back. Oh, because I never wanted to see that therapist because, because he's always trying to lead you down the wrong path. And I'm going to be there to stop this happening. Okay, so change positions and respond back to that headache. So you're starting to elicit a verbal discourse that goes with the feelings. So the, to people listening, that that, <laughs> that whole scenario that you've just come up with there might seem a bit out there. 
and maybe not what they would expect from a therapy session to put a headache on a pillow and have a conversation with it? Oh, I don't know. I don't know who's listening to this. Maybe people who are starting their counselling or therapy journey, maybe, or maybe people, therapists that don't use role play or uh, regress, use regressive work. Yeah. Might not be okay with what I've just said. Yeah. The therapists or counsellors that do use aggressive work and do use role play or do think about somatic processes of yes. discourse being held in the body would, I think, understand what I'm saying. Yeah. I think you're referring to people who perhaps don't work in that way or don't think developmentally or are perhaps beginning their whole journey. Well, yeah, and, you know, if, if there's some people that are listening maybe have, have heard you talking in the past about two-chair work and putting maybe a parent or, do you know what I mean, somebody else, you know, as in a person on the other chair, but to put a headache or an illness or a thing rather than a person on the chair, maybe not so much. Hmm. Okay, yes, I agree with you. But, but I love it, Bob. Many, yeah, I think you see, we hold so much in our body. Yeah. If we could do or invite clients to talk to parts of their bodies which are feeling bad or tired or tense, yeah, we'd often, I think, get back to the impasse or the block or the stoppage, which is actually instrumental in them not feeling psychologically healthy so one of the things i do regularly by the way is ask them to talk to their depression because often people come with depression or anxiety yeah i wouldn't do this in the first session don't get me wrong i mean obviously i need to know the person's story and build up a formulation and everything that goes with that yeah and ask them if they would like to do role play. So, I mean, this doesn't happen in the first session. Um, but I've often talked to people about depression and uh, get them to talk to the, their depression and have the depression talk back to them. And what we usually find is the driving force behind why the depression is there in the first place. Yeah, because it's a really interesting thing because it kind of bypasses the logical thinking, the... Do you know what I mean? The yeah. And let me tell you a very quick vignette, which is which it wasn't actually from me working clinically, um, but, but me doing something in the assessment, which might give a sort of uh, imagination to what I'm talking about. So some this is some time ago, some time ago, it must be two or three years ago, but it might explain what I'm talking about. So this person comes into the assessment she's about 48 she sits on the settee next to the settee i was sitting in so i say what i always say i know i've got half an hour i have a certain formulation which i go through and i start off what's brought you here she said you, her next sentence was you're my last hope wow now, when somebody says that my heart sinks because of the expectation and the responsibility of those sentences or sentence construction I said, wow, I'm your last hope. Yes, my doctor sent me um, because he's tried everything with me and it doesn't work and he's heard good things about you and thinks talking therapy might be useful. So I said, good, and what is what it is that you want? I want you to cure my depression. No pressure then, Bob. <laughs> no pressure at all. So I said, your depression. She said, yes, I've had it for 35 years. This is about 55 I've been to doctors for 30 years. I've been on all these antidepressants and everything else, but I've never tried talking therapy. Um, I want you to take it away. So I said, oh, it seemed to be three decades of this depression then. She said, yes, three decades. And I said, okay, so if we do reflect on where this depression started, she said, I've had it for ages, I've had it for ages. So then I say, and this is I say this in all assessments, I say, okay, so um, your family, your mum and dad alive, are they around? Oh, yes, my 
Um, my dad's around, but my mother died 10 years ago or whatever. And then I say, oh, so tell me a little bit about your mother, because I just want to know a little bit about where they live geographically or what it is. She said, well, it's an interesting thing, you know. She says, I've thought about this, but I never talked to a doctor about it. But it's an interesting thing. She had depression as well. She had depression all her life. And I remember I had to look after her when she went to depression. So I went to bed with depression. She incapacitated herself. XXX. So I said, wow. And then I said, I think this was a pivotal question, actually. I said, wow. And maybe the depression you've got isn't your depression. And she stood up. <laughs> she stood up and she said, what, my, not my depression? Well, you just told me your mother had depression for most of your teenage uh, life, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, maybe the depression you've got isn't yours. Maybe you've taken it from your mother's. She sat down, dumbfounded. And it was almost like a revelation. She said, wow, perhaps I have taken it from my mother. I said, well, perhaps you have. And she said, gosh, what do I do next then? I said, well, you go to therapy and you give it back to your mother so you don't have to have it anymore. Uh -huh. She looked at me as if I was talking Martian. <laughs> and she said, well, when can I start? <laughs> so I Love said, it. next week, fine. I said, I'll give you this therapist number, ring them up, organize a session. Anyway, about three months later, I was coming into the, the therapy center. It was in the morning and I, I bumped into her in the therapy institute. I said, I remember you. How are you getting on? She said, I've done it, Bob. I've done it. I said, what do you mean you've done it? I sort of remembered her. And she says, I've given the depression back. We were in the corridor. I said, great. That's fantastic. How do you feel? Much lighter. I feel 25 years younger. And what do I do next, Bob? <laughs> uh, what, what do I tick off I said, I said, well, talk to your therapist about it. And um, she'll have lots of ideas and how you can integrate your new way of being into your life today. That's amazing. So that's what I mean about depression. Whether I, yeah. it's a role play or not. But she would have actually given the depression back if it was me. Yeah. I'd have put the, the depression on a cushion and I'd have put the mother on the chair and I'd have said to the client, right, symbolically hand the depression back and say what you've never said before to your mother. Yeah. That's what I would have done. I've done it with, with clients with anxiety and I've said to them, why don't you leave it here with me for a week until yeah. you come back next week and I'll look after it and you can pick it back up yeah. next week when you're ready. I've done yeah. that sort of thing, yeah. That's symbolic, that's aggressive. Yeah. And they do look at you as if, do you know to I me, mean? what do you mean? Oh. And it's like, well, we do pick up anxiety and put it down again. We, you know, it's not with us all the time. Sometimes we're anxious and sometimes we're not. So just, you know, package it yeah. up and leave it here. Absolutely. So if we're talking about negative self-criticism, the step I said, getting back to the second step, after the first step of the making awareness is about where it's come from, you know, where it's come from, is for them to really make a pivotal decision um that it's not theirs yeah yeah and then thirdly what you do about that yeah and when uh, somebody has that realization it is like an epiphany it is it's like it's i would imagine it's not something they ever expect to hear that this isn't mine because it feels like mine i've, yeah. I've been carrying it around for like you said 35 years and i feel i feel it that's what my friend um, said it is mine now I wasn't in a therapy session and I haven't got a contract therapy. I wouldn't do therapy with friends anyway. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, so we didn't go down that line. But I, you're absolutely right. They felt it for this long. So it obviously has to be mine. Yeah. It's the thinking, just like you've just said it. Yeah. yeah. Another way of working with self criticism, by the way, is through hypnotism. Yes. And what I mean by that, better way than hypnotism, let's use a better word, imagery or a guided fantasy 
So um, you might, for example, uh, ask them to close their eyes, uh, uh, imagine the, uh, the depression, uh, what the depression looks like, what size it is, what color it is, um, XXX. And as they do that and they tell you that, you ask them to make the color a lighter color. You ask them to imagine where, where they are with the depression. And then you ask them to make the depression a lot, 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 lot smaller. Mm. And to imagine then when it's a lot, lot, lot smaller, to put the depression, say, on the um, top of your shoe or your foot or your knee and a place where you can control the depression because it's so small now. Yeah. It's so small. And, and then, then it's when... outside of you rather than... Yeah, in... yeah. yeah. So, you're, yeah. so you're making it from internal to external yeah. and you're making it a lot smaller in size. And thirdly, probably the most important, you're moving the depression to a place where you can control it. Yeah. And then you ask them to make it a lot more smaller. Yeah. Then you ask them to perhaps take the depression out of off the knee or the foot or whatever it is and put it somewhere else. And you can now so that's a way, a good way of dealing with. Uh, yeah, because uh, you know, when I think when we realize that we are in control of things, it changes everything. Um, you know what I mean? Somehow if we think it's part of us and I've I can never be without it. That's like hopeless, and we're out of control. So to have some control back again, I think, is a massive thing for clients. Oh, absolutely, and of course, it's transformational. Yeah. So they now this perhaps is the next part of the therapy after you started to desensitize or make the therapy, uh, sorry, the um, anxiety or depression or negative self criticism, whatever it is, smaller. Uh, and we're now in control of the negative. It's what we put in its place. Yes. And now, now you've made the negative self-criticism lighter, not so dark, not so heavy. Uh, what sort of transformation could we do? What could we have instead, which is the opposite of that negative self-criticism? How about a sense of to positivity? Yeah. And we then help them find a positive narrative, which they can put in the place of the negative narrative. Yeah, because that's a big thing. When you've carried something around for a long time, you know, it's it's not going back to it. It's having that grieving process or that sense of loss, even even if it's something really negative. When it's gone, it's kind of like this feels strange. So to put something back in its place that you know they can focus on yeah absolutely yeah you're right you're right, completely right because uh i had an assessment the other day and the first thing she said to me is i'm a negative person mm. now the part of the therapy will be doing what i've just said transformational work changing the negativity she's talking about to a sense of positivity now the issue is if she's defined her identity as a negative person yeah 100% correct Jackie she then has the challenge of transforming part of her own identity and how she sees herself yeah that's not a straightforward process and it, and it can be done yes yeah absolutely but again like you say it's it's not you know it's a slow process and it it's yeah i think when we take our eye off the ball it's easy to fall back into old patterns of behaviour. So, yeah, it does take time. It does. And also, uh, on another point, because I've been fixing a bit on the treatment, is we also need to find out the function of the negative self-criticism, the psychological function, I mean. Yeah. I remember talking to somebody who was, had a tremendously attacking negative narrative of herself, uh, which was how stupid she was and how she needed to not say anything, how she needed to withdraw and everything else. As we explored the function of that, she suddenly said, well, it's very protective 
for me to believe this. Yeah. And I said, oh, how come? She said, well, if I started to say positive things about myself, my mother would hit me. And I said, what, what do you mean? She said, well, she'd be jealous. She'd be jealous of taking the space and or the recognition away from her who wow. needed to be the most intelligent and the most perfect and the most wife to her husband. So she said, if I am stupid, worthless and hopeless and really believe that, that's, I'm, that's the function of this process. It's a protective one. Yeah. So we need to find out the function of how come we're so hard on ourselves. Yeah. That's interesting because often it doesn't make any sense to us. Whereas no. if we can understand what the function is, then it kind of makes sense. And then we don't, there's none of that blame and shame or whatever around it, if that makes sense. Oh, because 100%. Understand the point of it and why we've done it for as long as we have. Yeah. And if you trace back, however bizarre that process is in the present, it makes sense in context. Yes, yes, absolutely. It's yeah. a survival mechanism. Yeah. We need to have what you just said. We need to help them understand. Even if they understand it, we need to help them. How can I explain this? To be able to be aware of what needs to happen to change the process. Which, what you've done now for me and, and my thought process is you've took me full circle now. <laughs> And the, at that point, when we understand that it's a protection mechanism and it's a survival thing and everything, that to me is when I could show compassion to myself for doing it mm. because I kind of understood the reasons behind it. Mm. Oh, absolutely. Was for protection and taking care of myself. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I know uh, if I look at, I've done a lot of therapy, but I can share this because, well, but way back, I was far more hard on myself and self-critical and if you look at the psychological function that that is about it was very much about that I wouldn't be abandoned yeah uh rejected uh so I did I did and you're right you are right as I started to understand the psychological function and how I act out today and it doesn't help me I was much more able to be kinder and compassionate. Yeah. Yeah. So correct. Again, Bob, as always, I think it's an amazing thing that, you know, we, we do when we're looking at things at this level. Yeah, and I, one up final thing is, we've talked about how important it is to integrate a new way of being, but a final thing I think therapists and counselors think about is triggers. What triggers off that self-critical process is an important thing to help the clients um, understand the process of it. Yeah. That's another road counsellors and therapists can go down. Because what what is your thoughts on triggers? Is it, because I think a lot of people try to avoid the triggers. Yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. If they're aware that they are the triggers, yeah, yeah they will. Um, they'll tend to, find, but you know, well, let's make two points about this. Yeah, if they're consciously aware, because there could be, and there is, unconscious processes, so they're not aware of the triggers. But yes. go down the road you've just said, that perhaps they've had some therapy or they thought about things or they've worked out what the triggers are, they try to avoid them, so they don't go down this road, they go that road instead. So that's great, right? But then there's the unconscious processes, which they're not so aware of, which is not so easy to be in control of. Yeah. Because we can't always avoid triggers, can we? No, it's like red flags. But I think it does yeah. help if we can at least be aware of some triggers. However, as I've just said before, there may be some conscious triggers they're aware of, but they 
and they go down that road instead of this road. But as they go down that road instead of this road, they suddenly find themselves perhaps faced with things they hadn't expected to be faced with. Yeah. So, for example, people who might turn to drink as a crutch or a coping mechanism to dissociate with or to move away from the self with. So they become alcoholics, but that hasn't quite worked. So, or they've realized that's a trigger. But what they then do instead is perhaps turn to drugs. Yeah. So in other words, there's always other crutches they might move towards or things may appear which they hadn't thought of. So it's it's almost we it's almost impossible to um alleviate all triggers. Yeah. Cause I was thinking somebody that does have and I've got a few clients that I can think of that does have a fear of abandonment or rejection or you know things like that. And it manifests in a fear of commitment or not committing in relationships and self-sabotage and everything. But, you know, part of being a human being is that we want to, you know, we, we need to belong. So we want to be in a relationship. So knowing that there's a trigger there and what it is, then we've got to overcome that trigger sometimes. We can't just avoid it all the time. Well, let's go back to your first sentence. I'm not sure I agree with I think there's a biological imperative in terms of us being social animals. Yeah. I agree with you on that. Yeah. If someone has been so abused, so hurt, so and they're so scared and everything goes with it, part of them won't want to socialise dramatically. So there may be a desire underneath the trauma but you have to work through the trauma and the defense systems to get to the other part, which may, which will have the innate desire to be social. Yeah. So, yes, I think there's an imperative, you know, there's a hunger, if you like, whichever way we want to put this, a biological imperative to socialize and be recognized and everything goes with that. But if we've been so brutalized, we will it would be too terrorizing to go towards that part so we have to go through the defense systems to get to the other part so it does help to know some of the triggers which are defense systems really or yeah, coping yeah. mechanisms to get to what drives the process in the first place yeah amazing stuff bob as always. Interesting though, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Now, if we are kinder and if we are compassionate to ourselves more, and if we've integrated those new ways of being, I believe our lives will change fundamentally because two to three things happen. One, we're kinder and more compassionate to ourselves, and then we will be kinder and compassionate to other people. Yeah. And then we will surround ourselves with people who have an intrinsic sense of kindness and compassion, and then life will be very different in terms of quality. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it's just really interesting, Bob. Thank you for allowing me to talk about it, because it is an interesting one. Thank you for your expertise on that subject. No doubt the next one you will be just as... Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so what we're going to cover next time is flexibility, spontaneity and intuition in the therapy. Oh, well, of course, if we have high self-criticism, that limits the ability to have, be spontaneous. So it's a really yeah. interesting podcast that follows on from this. Until next time, Bob. Thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to The Therapy Show. Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.